All right, jumping right in, and I apologize for the audio. The uh, microphone situation is not ideal here. I'm on my laptop and visiting family. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a very introductory Photoshop tutorial that's kind of kind of touch on all the really core things, the basic things that you need to do to, to get anything done in Photoshop. We're not going to get into filters and uh, you know, all of the adjustment layers and all the blend modes. But we're going to touch on all that stuff so that you can kind of go in and start experimenting with it yourself. And what we're going to focus on a lot is going to be selections and a little bit of painting. Um, if you're already experienced with Photoshop, this probably isn't for you, but you can watch and maybe skip through the parts that uh, you find boring. We're going to do this in one long video that goes really in depth rather than breaking it up into a bunch of separate ones. Um, so we'll get started. We're going to be using these four images, this desert, this uh, texture here, this picture of a guy walking, this ship, we're going to create kind of a uh, mystical scene. And I'm going to start by just opening this up in Photoshop. So if you're in Windows, you can right click and open with, no, open with, uh, wrong thing. So we're going to go to open with Photoshop. And I'm going to be working in a different aspect ratio. Uh, in this case, I want to make this a poster for like A3 size. So I'm going to go ahead and open a new file that's already sized to A3. So we can go to print. And I'm going to go down to view all presets and just click on A3. This by default is in millimeters. And that's kind of fine. I'm just going to click create. We can leave all the rest of this stuff as is. And that's why we use the, the preset because it kind of has everything that we need for printing set up. The resolution, 300 uh, pixels per inch or dot per inch. And we're going to start bringing our resources into this file. Some we're going to do preparation on before we bring them in. Some we're going to bring it, uh, do preparation on after we bring them in. And just in case yours looks a little bit different uh, from mine, I'm going to go ahead and reset Essentials. So this is probably what you'll get when you first open Photoshop. You'll have this little Learn tab, which has a lot of handy skills. If you aren't used to uh, Photoshop, you also have libraries, which really handy, but we're not going to be using those quite yet today. So I, I strongly suggest using the Learn Tutorials if you need, but I don't want them, so we're going to get rid of those. I'm also um, really mostly just going to be using the channels and layers, so I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Now, I'm not going to do any preparation on this photo here. This is going to be our background, but this photo doesn't fit particularly well into our main format here. So you can just click and drag that layer and uh, drag it over the tab here at the top to activate that document and then just drop it in here. And when it drops in, it'll drop in at size. So with raster imagery, which this that's what this is, a raster document, and we can zoom way in here and we can see that this is made up of a bunch of little squares. Each square is a different color. And with raster images, they give you a lot of detail because you have all these little squares, each one a different color. It's really, really smooth and gives you these nice gradations. But they are what's called resolution dependent. Whenever you shoot the photo, uh, that's as big as it ever is going to be. You can't make it larger than that. When you're doing something like this with a physical printed medium, like a poster, that can be a little bit limiting. So even though this is a fairly large file, I think it's like 4,000 pixels across, when we go in to, to print it, it's actually not, not that much. We don't really have uh, that much resolution here. And it's actually considerably smaller than what we need. I'm going to hit Control-0, Command-0 if you're on a Mac, to zoom back out so we can see the entire thing. So we're going to need to fill in a lot of stuff. We're going to need to fill in up here. We're also going to need to fill in down here below because there's no way that we can make this fill. If I tried to make this bigger, what's going to happen is that it's just going to make uh, the pixels bigger and it's going to kind of guess and you're going to end up with a really pixelated image. So if I hit Control T and if you're on an older version of Photoshop, you'll need to hold Shift to keep it scaling proportional. Newer versions of Photoshop in, in Photoshop CC, they have finally changed this so that uh, scaling proportionally is the default behavior. So just drag this out here, again, holding Shift if you're on an older version or you, you have a Photoshop CC that hasn't updated. If we make this bigger, you can see now it fills up 
the screen, which is nice. But if we zoom in on this, uh, it is let me press enter to accept it. We've we've kind of lost resolution, and it doesn't look very good. We've got a lot of kind of grainy weirdness going on, and this is where Photoshop has added pixels, and kind of guessed at at what's supposed to be there, and. Its algorithms have gotten better at kind of guessing what should be there, but they're not great. They're not perfect. And so you, you never want to do that. So I'm going to undo that. You can either hit Control Z to undo, or you can go to this little history panel, which you should have. If you don't have the history panel, you can always go to Window and find it here, History. This is just a re uh, record of different actions you've taken in Photoshop. And I, what I did here, where I made it bigger, was called Free Transform. I'm going to go back to the move action, and you can see it's going to jump back to that. So I don't want to make it bigger. I never want to make it bigger than it started out. Um, I can make it smaller, but I can't make it bigger without losing resolution. And you don't you don't want to lose resolution. You might be able to, to make it just a tiny bit bigger, but not big enough to do what we need to do here. So we're going to use some other tricks that uh, Adobe's kind of developed over the years, uh, one of which is called the content aware fill which basically looks at the image and it uh, kind of guesses at what it should fill in and it's actually pretty good at that job before i do that though i want to position this compositionally such that i'm kind of uh, using my rule of thirds here the rule of thirds is is great for making sure that you don't just kind of put your your most interesting thing right in the middle uh, when you do that what tends to happen is that people look right at the center where they expect stuff to be and then they're done and they don't look at your image very long. By putting things off to the side, you're kind of playing with people's expectations a little bit. You put something where they didn't expect to find it uh, and kind of force them to look around the image a little bit more. And you can also play with, with balance. When you center something right in the middle of the image, everything is just going to be automatically balanced and it's going to be kind of boring. But when you use asymmetrical balance, position something off to the left a little bit, uh, and then kind of find other elements in that image to, to bring back balance, then it will make for a more dynamic, more interesting photo. And actually, this original photo was shot with the rule of thirds in mind. You can imagine a uh, line going down the middle here. And actually, if we hit C for the crop tool, and I'm just going to click here anywhere, the crop tool will actually give you, by default, a rule of thirds overlay. And you can see that the photographer actually got this, this tree pretty close to this left third. And the ground here is pretty close to this bottom third. Um, and that's actually something we can use over here. If I activate the crop tool and then just click outside of the document, don't click inside, but just click outside the document, uh, you can see where our rule of thirds lines are, which is pretty pretty handy. So we actually, we, uh, we're going to want to move this image just down slightly, but we can pretty much keep it where it is. We might move it to the left just a little bit. But we move it, move it down slightly to try to get this line closer to this um, bottom third. So I don't want to crop. I'm not going to do anything. So I'm just going to switch back to this move tool, which is also V on the keyboard. So V for victory is your move tool. And I'm just going to move this down. And by default, it should snap. Actually, I think I might have snapping turned off. So I'm going to go to view. We'll turn on snap. By default, you probably already have snap turned on. So mine is just off because I had turned it off earlier. So we'll move it down just a little bit and move it over just slightly like that. Actually, let's go ahead and put it there. That'll simplify things as for us a little bit. So now we need to fill in this bottom area where it's all white. We need to fill in this top area where it's all white. Right now, we have a background layer that's white. So we're seeing white there. That's from this background layer. If I hide that by clicking the little eyeball, we get this little grid. And what the grid means is that there's nothing there. It's just transparent. So that's going to be would be transparency in an image if we saved it out as a PNG or some format that supports transparency. Uh, but what I want to do is actually fill this in. So I'm going to click on, on this image again. And a quick way to select the stuff is to actually select our active or our, our area with positive alpha, which is the rest of this stuff where it actually has pixels. Uh, and to do that, I can hold control. You notice if you hold control, and this is com uh, command on a Mac, you hold control and click on the thumbnail of this layer. Not the same thing. You'll notice the cursor changes if I go over here by the layer name. But if 
I hold control and I click on the thumbnail, and I see people get confused with this all the time. I will tell them, hold control and click on this, and they immediately try to click on this layer here. Different, different functions. So hold control and click on the thumbnail of the layer where it's got the little picture. And you'll see the cursor changes to this little hand with a, a dotted line. That means that we're going to make a selection from this. If I hold control and click on that, you should get your little marching ants going all the way around this stuff. So we've selected this area where we actually have pixels. What I'm going to do is actually invert that selection. So you can go up to Select, and we're going to go to Invert, um, Select Inverse, which is Shift-Control-I or Shift-Command-I if you're on a Mac. Control is Command, basically. So when I say Control, I'm on Windows. If you're working on a Mac, just uh, keep in mind that that means Command. So Shift-Control-I. And now you'll see the marching ants are going around this here on the outside and around this area on the bottom. Now, this in this current version of Photoshop, you don't really need to do this because they've kind of fixed it. Um, but in older versions of Photoshop, you need to make this selection a little bit bigger because what will happen here is it's going to add this little, this little line. You'll notice that this selection is not actually coming right up to the edge of these pixels. It's like a pixel away. And so you need to expand that selection slightly so that it incorporates all this. Otherwise, you're going to end up with this little kind of transparent line going through the middle. They have fixed this in newer versions, but we're just going to go ahead and do it just so that people with older versions of Photoshop uh, don't run into that issue. So I'm going to go to Select, and I'm going to go to Modify, and I'm going to go to Expand. So Select, Modify, and Expand. And so you got to modify our selection and just make it slightly bigger. I have it set already at five pixels. I think the default was like three. Go ahead and do something like four or five. Click OK. It doesn't look like anything changed, but if we zoom in here, you can see that now that selection is is expanded outwards to get a little bit of this, this sky. And that's what we want. So Control Zero, just zoom back out. And I'm going to go to Edit. And this is where we're going to fill that in with our Content Aware Fill. So Edit, Content Aware Fill. If you're on an older version of Photoshop, you're going to find that under Fill. So I'm going to go ahead and go to it the old way. Uh, they do have a shortcut now, but if you don't see that, we're going to go to Fill. And instead of Contents, under where it says Foreground Color, we're going to click that drop down, and we're going to set it to Content Aware. And we can pretty much just leave this stuff as is and click OK. Just going to think about things for a minute. Now, if you're on a newer version of Photoshop, they have added a kind of new interface for this. And we'll, I'll undo this and we'll go back and look at that. I'm going to try to touch on older versions of Photoshop too, because I know a lot of people still have like CS6 and stuff. Um, control D to deselect. I and mean, you should have this nice um, fill where it's at. basically just added sky. And it's looking at this and saying, well, here's a bunch of blue gradients. And so I'm just going to add a blue gradient up here. Perfect. And down here, it's added kind of footprints. I mean, you can see there's just this little hint of a line here, which we can clone out. Uh, that's fine. But I'm going to go back and undo this. We're going to look at how to do it in the newer version. So uh, it's back on expand. I'm going to go back to edit. And this time, with the newer one, we, if you just go to content and fill, this is actually going to open up its own interface, which is kind of cool. Um, basically, what this does is anything that's, that's green here is going to add that to the selection. So you can say, well, I don't want it to look at this, so I can paint out that and say, don't look at that. And that's going to change how it calculates this image over here. It's probably not going to do much. Yeah, it didn't change much over here. Uh, but you can kind of control what it samples. So sometimes you'll go to use content or fill and you get some weird stuff, which with the older way, you have to clone that out manually. Uh, with the newer way, you can kind of tell it, you know, just don't sample that. So for instance, we might get something where it's it's adding this tree branch up here in the sky. Uh, and so we can just say, no, don't don't sample the tree branch, and then it will take that out for us automatically. You can see where it's getting some, some weirdness here. I'm going to go ahead and reset this so it's sampling everything. Uh, it does still have a little... Oh, no, it's taking care of that. All right, so we'll click OK, and that should then go in and fill in those selected areas with our content where fill. Now it's going to think about this for a while because there's a lot of pixel crunching to be done in this large resolution document. I'm going to hit Control D to deselect. And just down here, we can see that it's got this kind of line going on. We, we want to get rid of that. 
So we have some photo retouching tools, and these are the kind of tools that you might use if you're trying to remove blemishes from a model or just you know, get rid of things that you don't want to have in an image. Uh, there's here right under the patch tool, you probably are going to see the healing brush tool. It looks like a little band-aid um, or something like that, but it's right under the, the eyedropper. So we've got spot healing, healing brush, patch, uh, content aware, move, and red eye correction tool. So those are going to sample an area and then copy something else in, but kind of remain aware of the values and the brightness and darkness uh, that are in the area already. Uh, the other one is a little bit more direct and it's the clone stamp. So if you click and hold on these, really any of these that have a little uh, white arrow in the bottom right corner of them, you can click and hold and you'll see it's got more tools stacked under it. Uh, the clone stamp tool is basically just going to paint in a selection from somewhere else. So we'll start with that one. We'll see what that does and kind of how that works. I want to set a brush that's pretty basic. It's got kind of maximum hardness. We'll make it a little bit bigger so we can kind of see what it's doing. And if you try painting immediately, it's going to tell you this. It's going to give you this little error that says, could not use a clone stamp because uh, you, basically you haven't s selected something for it to sample from yet. Whenever you use the clone stamp tool, you're essentially painting part of the photo into another part of the photo. And before you can use it, you need to tell it you know, what you want to paint. So if I uh, want to define a selection, I need to hold the Alt key. And this is Option on a Mac. Uh, but hold Alt. Not doing it. There we go. You should get this little target cursor and click somewhere where you get something you want to sample. And you see, you now I'm painting this. It's going to place that orange that I sampled up here into the image. I don't want to do that. I want to sample some of the stuff down here. So I'm going to go ahead and grab I don't know, something like that. And I can paint that in. And you can see it's basically just cloning that in. It's pretty direct. We can adjust how hard or soft the brush is. So it fades in a little bit with stuff around it. So with a softer brush, you can see uh, that it's going to kind of fade out, um, whereas a harder brush is going to be, it's not going to mix with the rest of the environment. So we can kind of paint in like that. It's a quick way to, to kind of hide that, that line or some unsightly stuff that we don't want to have. You want to avoid here where we've got this little pattern and try to mix it up a little bit, maybe paint something else in. Just break up the pattern so, so we don't see that repetition. The other thing here, uh, these all do kind of the same thing, but with different different methods of going about them. So the healing brush tool is really just the uh, clone stamp tool, except it tries to blend in with stuff that's already there. I'm going to right click and make my brush size a little bit smaller. And this actually probably isn't going to be as as good even for this as the, the clone stamp was. Let's find another area. You can hear the boom sound is because when you press Alt, Windows shifts focus up to the toolbar. I, I wish they would change that, but they don't. I've been working on a Mac for a long time, and I've forgotten that whenever you press Alt, it activates this little toolbar up here. Uh, and so you try to do something, and it gives you this stupid noise. Um, I guess I could just turn off noises on Windows, but I haven't done that yet. So I'm going to hold Alt and sample that area, and I'm going to kind of paint this stuff in. And you can see that it kind of, it tries to mix with whatever the values are already. So if I sampled this, oops, sampled this area and then painted it up here, and notice it tries to match the color of what's already there. That's really what the, the healing tool does. If I click and hold on this, we go to the patch tool. I'm gonna drag a selection around this. So the patch tool, basically you drag, you create a selection Control D to deselect if you're not happy with that selection. So I'm going to select just this guy. I want to get rid of just that guy. Uh, so you can click and drag to sample something else. And you can see where it's basically putting uh, whatever we sample. If I sample this up here in the top right, for instance, it's going to place that into the area. Then you can just drag your sample to somewhere else. It'll place that, and it'll try to blend it with uh, whatever's there. And this is really actually one of my favorite tools for this kind of thing. Because you can just get a big selection, and it will really good job of blending with the stuff that's already there. And I'm just going to try to break up some of these patterns and some of the repetition that that um, content aware fill gave us. It's not a huge issue. It'd be nice if this was a little bit more true to life. Every time you do photo editing, it's a uh, kind of a balance of how much time you want to invest in it and, and 
versus how realistic you want it to be. So for the save, sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and leave it as is. That's really anything that you're doing in photos. It, it's very tempting to get involved in every single little detail, but really you want to kind of work the entire thing and kind of work from the top down, work the general to specific and get the basics and, and block out the most important stuff first and then start looking at you know details and, and how do I change this or change that. Um, compositionally, it would look nicer if this were kind of moved over a little bit. So I'm just going to do this and move this over slightly so maybe that tree is kind of off and give us a little bit more room over here. So let's do it like about that because I'm going to be adding a, a ship and a lot of content over here. So let's try this. Let's see how well Content Aware works like this just for the sake uh, of trying it out and we'll repeat some of the steps we just did. So control click this thumbnail icon to get your little marching ants. We're going to go out to uh, select and do inverse or you can do control shift I to invert. And you're going to get that little marching ant box. If you're on an older version of Photoshop, remember to go to select, uh, modify, expand, and expand it by about four or five pixels. I'm going to go to edit. I'm going to go to content aware fill. And again, if you're on an older version of Photoshop, you'll find that under fill. Go to content aware fill. Let's see what it calculates for us here. And that's actually not bad, but oh, you see it's, it's oh, it, it fixed it. Okay, so it did automatically fix it for us. Uh, that's actually not bad. That's surprisingly good at, at uh, just kind of guessing what should be there. So then let's go ahead and click OK. Let's see what we've got now. Hit Control D. And it's added some stuff in. Now those lines on the mountains are looking a little bit janky, but still believable. I guess if we need to, we can fix them, but I'm probably going to end up covering those up with content uh, later. So we don't really want to get into details of making this perfect we've got all of our stuff in it. We don't really want to go into the details of making this perfect before we've got all of our stuff in it. All right. So let's start preparing some of our other images to come in here. So some of the other things, we've got this hiker uh, and we've got this ship. And I've pulled all of these images from Pixabay. Uh, Pixabay Actually, I've got one, the desert images from Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S, and then Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. These are two free stock sites. Uh, I think Pexels is affiliated with Adobe Stock, and I think Pixabay is affiliated with Shutterstock. Um, they're just kind of depositories of, of photos that maybe didn't make it into Shutterstock or into Adobe Stock but the photographer had the option to put them up for free anyway under a Creative Commons license. So now you can download them and use them for projects like this, but always check under the Creative uh, Commons license what uh, is allowed. Like for instance, this one is free for commercial use and no attribution is required. So you don't have to give the artist credit. Uh, same thing with this one. And this one actually, I still need to, oh, there we go. Uh, free for personal and commercial use, no attribution required. But you do want to check uh, always, always, always check what is allowed, because if it requires that you give attribution, absolutely give people credit. And I like to try to give uh, photographers credit anyway, so I'll put some links to these in the description. Um, but we need to do some preparation with this. We're going to put this in as if it's kind of this worn out, like, uh, ship that, that got abandoned when, like, sea levels fell or something. So I'm going to open this. So we'll right-click and open with Photoshop. But unfortunately, there's some preparation that needs to be done with this first. Obviously, we need to cut this ship out of its background. Um, anybody can pretty much use these selection tools. So these are the basic selection tools, uh, is the Quick Select and Magic Wand, both of them under the W, or click and hold on Quick Selection, and you'll find Magic Wand. Magic Wand works like this. You click on something you want to select, and Magic Wand tries to figure out what else you want. You can hold Shift. You'll see it changes. You get a little plus sign next to the cursor there. You can hold shift and say, well, I also want this, and I also want this, and I also want this. You can hold alt or option on a Mac. You'll see it changes to a little minus sign. Oops. <laughs> Keeps changing focus. There we go. Nope. This is one thing that always drove me nuts about Windows is that the alt key does weird stuff. All right. And say, uh, well, I don't want this, actually, and I don't want this, and I don't want this. 
this is not a very good selection tool for something this complex because we have all of these little lines and stuff that we want to keep and all the sky in between them that we want to get rid of. Uh, so this is never really going to work very well for that. You could spend forever trying to select all of those little things with it. Same thing with the magic wand tool. I'm going to hold control D to deselect. And the magic, or the, um, the quick selection tool rather, you basically just paint selections over what you want. And it's actually a little bit better and works similarly to the magic wand. You just keep painting and say, I want to select this, and I want to get all this stuff. And it kind of, it tries to find the edge for you. But again, you're not going to get great detail with this. You can remove things, you hold Alt, and you can remove stuff. You got to say, I don't want this. But Photoshop doesn't know, doesn't understand things by ship. All Photoshop understands is the difference between uh, this pixel, let me hit V so I can see, this, this pixel and this pixel. It knows the difference in value between this one and this one. It says light and this one's dark. And this one is, you know, there's more of a difference between these two than there is between these two. And that's really all Photoshop knows about this is the different uh, value uh, changes. So that's not going to work for us. Uh, we're going to need to do a more complex selection process. And, it, and really with Photoshop, you'll probably spend most of your time making selections, just telling the software what you, know, you want to cut out of what other thing, and trying to source photos that make that easier. I've selected this photo specifically because it's, it's a little bit easier. This is a pretty straightforward process, but it can get more involved in terms of painting in different selections and, and things like that. So the way that we're going to make a selection with this is we're going to use channels. Every image, every RGB image, has these three channels, our red channel, our green channel, and our blue channel. And yes, red is in black and white, green is black and white, and blue is black and white. What these are is basically each one is a map of how much red light is applied, how much green light is applied, or how much blue light is applied. The brighter the area, the more blue light is there, the darker the area, the less blue light is there. These are the additive primaries. So if we turn on just red and green, we're going to get yellow. Red and green make yellow in an additive system. Don't worry about mixing in additive systems if that seems weird to you. Don't worry about that for now. We're not going to be mixing additive stuff just yet. Uh, green and blue make um, teal or uh, uh, cyan. And then blue and red, we think make purple, but actually make uh, magenta in this color system. So these are our um, color channels, red, green, and blue, all of them together, laid on top of each other, make this this image. And we're going to be using one of these channels to uh, basically create a map of alpha. So we have red, green, blue, and alpha is going to be our transparency. So we can use one of these, but we kind of want to figure out you know, which one is, is going to give us the best contrast. If I look at red for here, for instance here. Red has decent contrast between the sails and the sky. It's maybe a little bit light. The problem is that red also has really bright areas here where those yellow lines on the ship are. Remember red and uh, green make yellow. So in both red and green, these yellow areas are going to be fairly bright. Uh, so if we switch to green, see this is also fairly bright. Whereas yellow involves almost no blue. So if we go to blue, these are quite dark. Now, looking at the rest of the image, green is pretty light up here in the sails. Red is also even lighter up here in the sails. So neither red nor green would be a great option for this because we want a generally good contrast all around. It's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be some area of the subject that, that you want to keep that you're going to have to manually paint in and out. In this case, it's going to be the flag. So even though blue is really the best option for us, we're going to have to manually paint in these little stripes on the flag because they are so light. We're going to have to manually paint in this little like radar or radio or whatever this is. Um, not a big deal. We'll just keep that keep that in mind. And as you make more complex selections, those are going to be things that you need to worry about. So step one for making a selection, most important, super, super important, is duplicate this. You don't want to start editing your blue channel because it's going to mess up your, your image. What you do want to do, though, instead is duplicate this channel. So we're going to right click, duplicate, and we give it a name. We'll call this our alpha. And click OK. And then we're going to switch to alpha. Right now, alpha and blue 
look the same. And actually, if we turn on RGB now, we're going to have this kind of red overlay. Essentially, what's going to happen is we want to get it such that the background is all red and the ship is just kind of normal colors, but we're not uh, obviously there yet. So we'll turn off RGB by clicking the little eyeball. That will turn off all of the RGB channels at once. And look just at the alpha channel. What we want to do is essentially get the contrast between our subject and our background as high as possible. We want to have our subject white and our background black. We're going to be inverting this a lot though, so sometimes the subject will be black, background white, and we're going to go back and forth with it. Um, but as always, work general to specific. So I'm going to go in here to my burn tool, which is under the dodge tool, which the dodge tool is a little circle with a line sticking out of the bottom left. And click and hold on that. We're going to go to burn, and burn is a little little hand making a circle. I'm not sure what that has to do with burning, but that's what the uh, icon is. What burn tool does is basically just make things darker. Um, before we set our our size, yours by default is probably set to midtones, and your exposure is probably set to like fifty percent or something. We're gonna change that. What we want to do is we want to make the darkest parts darker, and we want to leave the midtones and the highlights, the lightest things, untouched. So I'm gonna set this at the top to shadows. And just to keep it from being too strong, I'm going to change the exposure to like 14-ish, 20-something, somewhere around there, like the, the high teens to 20s. Now, I also, again, remember general to specific work, the entire thing. Um, so I want to try to get the biggest, kind of largest changes done as early as possible. I'm not going to use any of the rest of this image. So one thing that I can do really fast right off the bat is just crop this in so I don't have to worry about so much extra stuff. So we're going to crop this right. We don't want to crop it right up to the edge. We'll leave a little bit of space there. I'm going to go ahead and drag this over and bring it as close to this point. So again, we'll bring this down a little bit and we'll bring this part up a little bit. So that removes a lot of work that we have to do in terms of darkening the rest of this. To accept your crop, just press enter and that will accept the crop. So now we've got less stuff that we have to, to deal with. Now, I'm going to go to my burn tool again. We also want to make sure to work the entire thing. And we're going to start with a really, really big brush, and then we're going to keep making it smaller and smaller. This is really important because if you start with a small brush, you're going to end up with this kind of blotchy, weird looking effect. What we want to do is we want to get a nice, even uh, burn. So we're going to size this brush up and make it really, really big, basically the size of the entire document, if we can a little bit bigger than that. Actually, this is a little bit frustrating. So I'm right clicking to get this menu, just right clicking anywhere, not out here, but in here in the document, you can get this brush menu. Um, that's not the, the easiest way to do that. If you hold the Alt key, so this is different on Windows and Mac. If you hold the Alt key on Windows and right click and drag left and right, will change brush size and up and down will change brush hardness. We're gonna keep a pretty soft brush. So I'm gonna drag up for soft right for a larger brush. And I think on a Mac, it's, um, it's the maybe the same thing, actually. Uh, maybe it's Control-Alt, right-click and drag. I'm not 100% sure about the Apple keyboard shortcut. You might want to look that up. But we're going to get something like that there. So to burn this, you just kind of click and drag. And it's going to start making the darkest parts even darker. Now, it will start making midtones darker as we go, and you want to be careful of that. So you want to watch out that it doesn't make the sky and stuff that we want to get rid of darker. But we do, we can kind of use its ability to see light and dark to kind of customize this. And so we're going to very quickly, very lightly kind of go over and touch up the edges of this. Now we're going to start to make this brush a little bit smaller. Now, another way to make your brush larger and smaller is the bracket keys. So just to the right of the P, you've got um, square brackets and curly brackets. Uh, the left square bracket will make your brush smaller, and the right square bracket will make it bigger. So I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. So that I'm kind of touching just this. And I'm actually going to go ahead and make my exposure a little bit less here, too. So we'll take that down to 8%. We want it to be a little bit lighter here. So it doesn't affect it quite so much. 
This might take a little bit of practice to get this right. Uh, again, always, always, always start with a really, really big brush and start kind of working the entire thing. Don't kind of focus on one detail and then move to the next detail and the next detail. Work from from zoom down. It's tempting to zoom into a thing and, and get that perfect and then zoom out, but that takes a huge amount of time. And then you find out that you messed something up and you gotta undo and, and start over. So you don't wanna do that. Um, once you've kind of darkened this to about this point, you want to actually start working on the background instead. So we don't wanna just focus on our subject. We also need to start pushing the background. So we're kind of pushing and pulling. We're pulling the, the foreground out and pushing the background out. Uh, there are a couple of ways to do this. You could switch to your dodge tool. The dodge tool does the opposite of the burn tool and it just makes things lighter. Um, what I'm gonna do instead though, because I don't wanna manage two different tools, I'm gonna hit Control I and that will invert the image. So Control I, basically just invert the colors. So now the what was darkest is now lightest, and what was lightest is now darkest. Be straightforward. Again, fairly big brush. Keep working with a big brush. I'm actually going to make this brush just a bit bigger. And try to get a nice, even coverage. We don't want to touch. We don't want to touch these ropes too much. We do want to just kind of touch, touch up the background and kind of push that that darkest stuff back a little bit. And really my metric of, of when I've gone too far is if I start to lose those those ropes there, that means I've, I've gone too far. I'm gonna hit Control I, I'm gonna come back here and we're gonna make the brush a little bit smaller so that we're just working like on the sails and just the ropes not getting the, the background too much. Then we can get the rest of the ship here Try not to touch the water because the water is already fairly dark, so I don't want to darken that any more than it already is. Get the sails and really push those and try to darken some of these ropes here. Once we start darkening it to the point though that the, the sky starts to get too dark, then we need to, to stop. And you see it's kind of darkening the sky there already, so we're going to kind of burn these out. And you'll see it's, it's basically just creating more contrast for us here. So I'm going to hit Control i again and go back. I'm always working general to specific. Let's make our brush a little bit bigger before I kind of get sucked into that and start pushing the background here back even further. All right, let's make our brush a little bit smaller. probably be, in most images, there's going to be some stuff that you have to manually paint out. Fortunately, in this image, you can actually get all of this by just doing the, the burn and dodge tool to kind of push and pull. Some images are super easy. You can just use levels or just use curves and you're done. But I, it seems like a lot of the, the images that I've used, to, you've never, <laughs> I've never personally been able to get everything done by just using adjustment layers. So. We'll probably use one at the end just to kind of finish this up, but uh, for the most part, most images you need a little bit more finesse than that gives you, so it's good to, to use these. Now I'm going to keep going over this here in the, the water. The water is fairly uh, bright here. It's, it's really close in value to the ship, unfortunately, so we kind of got to go over it quite a bit. And what's going to happen is we're going to end up with these little islands of of really light stuff, but we'll just kind of keep keep hitting it, try to stay towards the bottom, use the softness of the brush to keep it uh, from getting kind of cutting into the ship itself. Now this is the shadow. If we look at this, actually real quick, let's just pop into RGB and let's turn that alpha off. We do have a little shadow of the ship, and actually it's kind of handy sometimes to keep your original shadows. So you might want to keep that and not uh, not cut out the shadow completely, so just keep that in mind. It's easier to keep the shadows from the original image sometimes than it is to try to make new shadows. 
gives it it helps ground it as well like we're going to be placing this on the desert floor so having a little shadow underneath it will just kind of help to ground it there so this is getting pretty dark it's looking very mysterious like a foggy kind of ship we could almost use this as its own image here but we're not going to now I, I do want to be really careful we're kind of getting to the point where I'm starting to lose some of these ropes if I go too far so I'm going to start making my brush smaller I'm trying to touch up areas between the ropes which is a little bit difficult with just a mouse I can use my stylus here but unfortunately my microphone setup's not going to let me do that so yeah so I went a little bit too far there so I'm going to actually undo that I'm just going to paint this I'm going to keep working around these edges to kind of get rid of the ghosty effect there I might even go ahead and drop this exposure down just a tad so it's not too much so we're not kind of pushing too much with any given click so kind of burn burning all this misty stuff away is, is what we're doing here at the top is tough because in the original image there's a lot of um, atmospheric perspective stuff going on there is it's kind of faded out at the top and so that makes it tough so we got to be careful with that because that's where we're going to lose some of the ropes if we lose a couple of them it's fine we can kind of rely on implied line uh, we do want to try to keep as as many of them as possible this is the kind of thing that you would do with a model who has you know really complex hair that you want to remove from a background that's why if you're shooting, if you're photo um, a photographer and you're photographing a model in the background, you want to use a white background because then you can much more easily uh, kind of cut out hair and stuff. That's why uh, typically models in just a very dull background do better because you can cut them out and do, you know, place them wherever you, you want them pretty quickly. Um, give the designer the options of, of what to do with the so there that's again let's go ahead and invert hit control i and so you can see we've actually lightened these sails considerably in the process of doing that so we're going to go ahead and burn these guys back in i'm going to make our exposure just a tad stronger so we can burn these a little bit more quickly we've we've got pretty good definition now between the background and like the ropes and the sails and stuff, but we want to just make sure to push that stuff as far as possible. We don't want to end up with like transparent sails. The nice thing about this method though is that if you miss a part and you go in and you place it in your new image, uh, this is going to be non-destructive. Lots of people immediately with the background, they say, well, I want to get rid of the background, and so they run and they grab the erase tool. And that is no, 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 no. Don't use the erase tool because the erase tool, if you mess up, or you forget a part, you have to go back and fix all of that, which that's a huge, huge pain to have to go back and redo a bunch of work because you messed up one little thing with the erase tool. Once something is erased, it's kind of gone. And not kind of gone, it is, it is gone, unless you have history states to go back, which you will eventually run out of history states and that'll be gone. Uh, whereas this, what we're gonna be creating is a mask. In a mask, you can always go back and edit a mask as much as you want until you apply the mask and flatten it out you can edit that mask uh, to your heart's content you can keep changing things and keep revising things and keep tweaking things and working non-destructively is is very very important so we've kind of got this pretty close now there's a little bit of a kind of a ghosty thing going on there control i and try to touch that up but i think it's at this point we can go ahead and use our levels or some uh, larger tool to kind of get rid of some of the ghosty stuff and things that we might not see or stuff that we might miss so with levels and if you've used photoshop before you've probably used the adjustment uh tools down here unfortunately we don't have that in channels you can't apply an adjustment layer to a channel but you can still use some of your adjustments on channels so i'm going to go up to image and under adjustments you'll find 
adjustments. Uh, you typically don't want to use these because these are destructive. Like a layer adjustment, you can always go back and tweak things, and we'll use those a little bit later. But uh, with these, once you've applied them, they're, they're kind of done, like they're just there. Um, so use these sparingly, but in this case, since we're working on channels, we have to use adjustments. I'm going to go back to curves here. Uh, either curves or levels, they're both an interface that gives us a similar thing. Well, actually, we'll use curves later. Let's go ahead and look at just levels for now. It's a little bit simpler, so we're going to go to adjustment, levels, and we can see a histogram of how much dark. Uh, this is the darkest area, so black being the far left, white being the far right. Uh, this shows us how much of each one is here, and if we start to drag these around, we can start to tweak this. So if I want to make the darkest darks even darker and include some of this darkest stuff, like the misty parts, I can start to drag the slider over. But you'll notice the further we go, the more we start to miss those those ropes and things. So we need to be careful with that. We don't want to go too far. This doesn't give us a lot of control. Now we can also adjust our midtone, our midpoint. So we can move our midpoint further that way. We can also push our lights out, but that's actually, we don't want to do that. We want to play around with this. I don't know if this is actually going to do what we want it to do. I think we need to keep going with the burn tool. So not, uh, not ready for that yet. So we'll go ahead and keep burning. I would love to use adjustments more. It's just that these are not, um, give us quite the control because you can't control where it applies an adjustment and you can't control how strong an adjustment is in one area versus another area. You can with adjustment layers because you can apply a mask to the adjustment layer which we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later um, but it just doesn't give us very much control so it's kind of it's kind of tough. That's why I'm saying I've never personally had an image where I could just apply an adjustment to a channel and boom, done. That's the uh, the cutout that I need. I always end up having to burn. And eventually I just quit using the adjustments entirely and just started burning straight away. That's actually pretty close. So what you should have is this white ship on a black background. Now, it is tempting to go in and make everything perfect and try to make all of these you know, perfectly like all the ropes perfectly light and all the the uh, background perfectly dark. But unfortunately, what's going to happen is you're going to end up with this really, really strong high contrast thing that uh, you get these kind of jagged edges. So you want to leave it a little bit soft. And that'll actually help to um, blend into its background. Because anything that's kind of gray will actually be slightly transparent. So it's still there. We can still see it, but it's, it's actually going to let some of the color of the layer underneath it through. So we're actually going to leave some of that stuff kind of gray, uh, and that'll be fine. So how do we use that? I'm going to click on RGB, go back to our layer, uh, layers here. How do we use that to cut this ship out? Well, first we need to change this from a background into a regular layer. So I'm just going to right click and go to layer from background. Call it. Actually, let's go ahead and call it ship. So I'm going to double click on that. We'll call it ship. Uh, always good to name your layers so you know what you're working with. I'm going to go back to channels though, and I want to turn this into a selection. Uh, to do that, kind of similar to the way that we selected the the background in this other file to do our um, content aware fill, except on channels. So with the channel, hold Control. You'll see that cursor changes just like it did before to like a hand with a little box around it. So hold control, click on the alpha channel. It doesn't need to be visible. We just click on it and you'll see little marching ants going around it. Now the marching ants aren't getting like the stuff up here. Don't worry about that. It has literally copied this black and white image that we made. Uh, and even though the, the marching ants aren't showing everything that's in white, uh, trust that they will be copied over because it's going to be exactly the same thing that we've we've got over here. So I'm going to go to layers, click on the ship so it's active, and when we click the mask button with this add layer mask, anything that's currently selected will basically become the layer mask. It will, will mask out um, whatever is black will become transparent, whatever is white will become opaque. So I'm going to click that, and we're going to end up with this little black and white layer mask where we have the white shape of the ship and the black background. And this is 
we can still go and tweak this. We can go click on this. Right, right now it's active, so we can go in there and I can paint white. So if I switch to my white tool and then paint white up here, we can paint that background in. Control Z, let's paint down here so we can see how it paints in. Basically, we're just uh, adding that background back in. That's why masks are so handy. You can always go back and tweak stuff. You can also invert the masks. So if I hit Control I, now we'll see that the ship is cut out and the background is, is there. So the ship now is black and the background is white. Uh, so white is going to be opaque and black is going to be um, transparent. So our ship is ready. Let's go ahead and drag this layer. I'm going to go ahead and save this. So we'll go ahead and save as. Uh, let's call it. That's fine. And that way, once I've got this layer over, I can close that out and get it out of memory. So I'm going to drag that up to the tab, just like we did before, and then drop it in here somewhere. Let's go ahead and close this guy because we don't need this anymore. And I'm going to activate my move tool up here at the top, or V on the keyboard. Now, just like before, we can't make this any bigger. And this image was considerably smaller than this, so we've our ship is kind of stuck. We can't make it larger, uh, but we can make it smaller. And I'm not really sure where I want to put this. I might want to make it a little bit smaller, but I, I, I know I can't make it larger. I can flip it left and right, and I can move it around, but I, I can't make it any larger. Um, a way around this, though, is to use perspective and the placement of the, the ship in the image. If I place it down here, um, we're going to see it as if it's in the foreground in, in three-dimensional space. And we have a frame of reference. We have an idea of this, this tree. So if I place this ship here in the foreground, that means that it should be larger than the tree. And the fact that it's much smaller than the tree tells us that this the ship is like a toy. It's like this tiny, tiny ship because it's smaller than the tree. We don't know exactly how big the tree is, but we know that the tree should be smaller than the ship. Now, if I move the ship up, the further up it goes, the bigger it appears to be. So if I move it so that it's basically directly in line or kind of on the same same three-dimensional space with the tree, now it's looking considerably bigger. Now it's looking like it's as tall as the tree because they're both in the same distance. At, at, at that distance, they're both pretty much going to appear to be the same size. And if I move it even further, so move it even higher now, now it's going to appear to be really, really big because we see these other trees back here that are tiny. And this tree, um, which we can assume is roughly the same size as, as those, now the ship is, is towering over them. So now the ship is going to appear to be much larger because of where it is in 3D space and how things get smaller with distance. The size of the ship has remained constant, but the distance appears to have increased, so the ship appears to be bigger. Now, I want to kind of mess around with the, the placement of this. I would prefer to have it kind of facing to the left, uh, and I might want to make it a little bit smaller than this, actually, just so that it doesn't look quite so huge and it's not taking up quite so much space. Before we do that, though, before you play around with the size of, of anything, I'm going to go ahead and hide our background here. Uh, we want to look at a way that, that uh, Photoshop handles images. I'm going to hit Control J to duplicate this. I'll just move our duplicate over to the right here so it's kind of in line. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this one again. I'm just going to hit Control J once more so we have a couple of duplicates. I'm just going to hide the original so I want to be able to get back to the original. Um, so we've got this, this one on the left, and this one on the right here. Um, this one on the right, this top ship copy, I'm going to right click and I'm going to set that to smart objects. So right click, uh, don't right click the thumbnail, that's going to give you different options. Or if you right click the mask, even different options, but right click click on the name, and that's going to give you this context menu. And we're going to go to convert to smart object. And it doesn't appear to have done anything, but we're going to look at what this is, is actually doing. So I'm going to hold Shift and select both of these. I'm going to hit Control T as our transform. You can go to Edit and go to the uh, Transform, Free Transform, but I'm just going to do Control T. It's going to bring up our Transform tools. Again, if you're using an older version, remember to hold Shift so it scales proportionately. 
Uh, I'm just going to hold Alt. So you notice it's scaling to the bottom left corner because I started at the top right. Uh, I'm going to hold Alt and it'll actually scale to the center. So hold Alt or Option on a Mac, you can scale it down to the center. I'm going to make it really tiny, say down to like 0.3 inches or so. Perfect. Hit Enter to accept that transformation. So make sure to hit Enter. We can see now our little tiny, tiny ships there are, are scaled way down. And if we zoom in on these, um, you can see that this is all the pixels now that make up this ship. This is essentially all that we have left. It's just little, this little handful of pixels. And hit Control Zero to zoom back out. And hit Control T again to scale this up. Again, holding Alt so it scales from center. And if you're on an older uh, version of Photoshop, remember to hold Shift so it scales proportionately. I'm just going to scale this back up about like that. Like that. And press Enter to accept it. The one that we converted to a smart object here stays nice and clean. It looks exactly like it did before. Whereas the one that we did not convert to a smart object, those pixels essentially got thrown out. When we scaled it down, it threw away all of the pixels that made that ship. And so when we scaled it back up, then it looked at, at that little handful of pixels we had left and kind of guessed at what it should make. So if you're moving things around a lot and you're not sure necessarily how big you want it, you want to go ahead and convert it to a smart object. Now, that comes with the drawback of your mask will no longer be editable once you you apply it. But really, at this point, we're, we can look at this and we can say, you know, the mask is pretty pretty much fine. Like, there's not anything that we need to do with that. So we can go ahead and convert this to a smart object and be done with it. Now, let's go ahead and delete this one. If there is, for some reason, maybe I want to go back to, to have the mask better, you can always just make a duplicate with uh, the mask and then hide it. And just to... Get rid of these. I'm gonna hold, uh, or just to put them together. I'm gonna select them both. Hit, uh, hold Control and hit G for group. And then we'll put them into a little group just to keep them organized. No, we don't want it all in caps. Let's go ahead and take. There we go. So that's our ship folder, and we can expand this out and do different things with it, and add more stuff into that folder, and then collapse it all so it doesn't make a huge mess out of our layer stack. All right. So let's go into our ship layer, and I'm. I'm going to grab this, this uh, uh, smart object, right click, or let's do uh, control T, I'm going to right click, and we'll put horizontal, so it's somewhere about like that. I'm going to just scale it down slightly because I don't want it to be quite that big. Move it over a little bit, so something like that. We can say that this is basically just going to go for this kind of like rusted out ship off in the distance a little bit, this kind of old ship. And then looking at the where this is in space, it's kind of like on the same, uh, at the same distance as this tree right here and kind of scaling it to match that tree. So we can put it about like that, that looks fine. And it still looks like this huge ship, even though now it's off in the distance. All right, so now let's go ahead and uh, look at another selection technique with our humanoid. We'll fix the, the colors and stuff and bring all this stuff together a little bit later. I'm going to go back into my folder. I'm going to right click on this and we're going to go to open with Photoshop. And we'll open up this uh, hiker. Got so another way of selecting things uh, is using the pen tool. And the pen tool will also work with vector shapes, but Photoshop isn't really a great vector editor. You're really better off using Illustrator for that, especially since now they're all included in one subscription. Of course, if you're just subscribing to Photoshop, you can do vector work if you need to, but really um, they, don't, they don't work quite as well as they do in Illustrator for most things. The pen tool is a little bit uh, finicky to get used to, uh, and they do have a little tutorial here if you mess over. It kind of shows you how it works, but basically uh, if you click once, it gives you a corner point. So each time you click, it gives you a sharp angled corner. And then when you get back to the end, you'll see the cursor changes to a little circle, which means that you're going to close the path and complete the path. And we can use paths for selection, which we'll get to in just a little bit. You'll find out uh, all of your paths show up here in this paths area, and it shows up as a temporary work path, which you can then save 
as a permanent path. Now, if you click and drag, you get these little things called bezier handles, and these allow you to have nice curvy lines. You can get more organic shapes with your path. Um, you can also do a combination of curvy and corners. So you can do curves like that and then a corner. So you can get a combination of sharp and curvy lines. And these are really just controlled with the uh, modifier keys. So as you're draw drawing it out, if you're not happy with the placement, you can hold the space bar to move your point around. So otherwise it's just going to move your, your uh, busy handles around. So you can hold the space bar and move it to where you want it and then click your next point, drag it out, click your next point, and then hold space bar to move around if you want. Uh, unlike Illustrator, though, you don't have as much control with the, um, the control key. You can hold the Alt key to change the direction so that you could get like a point kind of going that way if you wanted, but you can't use the, the control key. So what we're doing here, because part of this guy is difficult to select, these pants on this green background are a little bit difficult to select. We can probably just use the, the regular um, selection tools like the magic wand and the, the uh, lasso to select this guy up here. But down here along these pants, it's a little bit more difficult. So what we're going to do is use the uh, pen tools, go ahead and make our, our pen selection, create a selection, and then add to it with the lasso. And we can select this shadow as well with our um, I'm sorry, not last, but the, the magic wand. So I'm just going to start by kind of following the curves here. If you want, you can zoom in. And that does help a little bit. Like there at the top of the shoe, I've got a corner. And then here I've got kind of a curve. And the more of these you put, the more detail it's going to have. And it's real easy to kind of get, get sucked into details with this. You kind of need to think about how big this, this guy is in the final image. He's going to be pretty small, so I'm not super concerned about the, the details. We can always kind of paint in the mask later if there's there's an issue. It's always editable. So if I see, you know, it's got like some weird green line or something, I can always fix that later. So in this case, at least, I don't need to be super picky about where these points go. It just doesn't pay to, to kind of waste the time doing that. So I'm going to follow this around and get some of these little finicky bits here. We'll go ahead and just make this one big curve like that. It's holding space for to move that back down. And we'll drag that guy out something like that. And this does take a little bit of practice. If you you have trouble with it the first time, don't worry. I think everybody struggles with the pen tool a little bit and just remembering what it's doing. Uh, it does help a lot to pay attention to your cursor, see what your cursor is, is doing, and the cursor will definitely help you, you know, um, see what the, the pen tool is about to do, like closing paths and stuff like that. I'm not going all the way around the torso. Again, it's going to be easier to actually select the torso just by using the, the magic wand. So we'll do that later. I'm just going to kind of go around this stuff because I know this is going to be a little bit difficult to, to uh, magic wand select later. So we'll get this close here. One thing that I, I definitely do want to do is uh, get that little space between the legs where you can see the grass between the legs because that is difficult to, to select with a magic wand. And honestly, you could probably just do this with the magic wand and then tweak it with painting, but I wanted to show you uh, how to do path selections as well. These are really best for when you have a really, really clean line you want to get. Um, paths will, will help. And these are based on vector art, which is scalable. It's not resolution dependent. It's resolution independent, uh, which means you can make vector you know, as big or as small as you want. And so in Illustrator, you'd use the pen tool like this to create, you know, different organic shapes and stuff uh, that can scale infinitely. So you can put it on the side of a bus or put it uh, on a postage stamp and, and just use the same art for both of those things without worrying about loss of quality or anything. So as I'm getting down here around the, the boot, I'm going to run into some more curvy lines. And I have to kind of guess because this is all dark. I'm going to have to kind of guess where his 
his boot is. It looks like he's lifting his foot up, so it might be kind of a... Let's actually control Z that. I'm going to put a corner there, and it looks like his boot is kind of curving around like that, and then we'll complete it. It may or may not end there, but we kind of have to, to accept that. Now, before I forget, I want to go ahead and get this part here. Now, what's going to happen with this uh, so I'm going to have a path inside of a path. Right now I have this whole thing kind of outlined with my vector path, and when I add another one on the inside, this is going to create what's called a compound path, where you have a, a shape inside of a shape, and what's going to happen is that it will be turned into a hole, basically. If you think of a donut, um, the outside line of the donut is like the main circle, and then you make another circle on the inside, and then turn those into a compound path, and that's what gives you the, the hole in the middle of the, the donut uh, shape. All right, let's go ahead and complete that. All right, so now we've got two complete paths. We have one inside the other. And to turn this into a selection, pretty straightforward, just like before, hold Control, and then click on this. Uh, like the layer, though, it does have to be click on the thumbnail. If you click on Work Path, holding Control, it, you, you see the cursor doesn't show that little uh, box, so it's not going to make a selection. So hold control, click that, and you'll see that it, it did not add that to the selection, but it did add everything else. I'm going to hold uh, control and hit zero, and we'll just add the rest of this stuff using this, um, you know, it's a quick selection. I've been saying magic wand is actually the quick selection tool. Let's actually zoom in just a little bit. And so since we already have a selection, I'm just going to start, I'm just going to click and start uh, painting in here. And this actually ends up torso and stuff. It should have enough definition around the edges that it can figure this out pretty well. Uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. See, like it forgot, like it didn't recognize that little bit right there. So let's zoom in on that. I'm going to go ahead and see if we can get it to add that without grabbing a bunch of stuff from the background. Yeah, yeah, so you know, it's trying to get some of the stuff in the background there because it doesn't see the difference between them very well. With selections, it's always better to make them a little bit smaller uh, than what you want and to cut into your subject just a, a tiny bit, like a pixel, because if you don't see it, then you didn't know it was there, then you don't miss it. But if you see it and it clearly doesn't fit, then that raises problems. Like right there, I'm getting like this little bit of green right here too. Uh, which obviously doesn't belong, and so that's really going to stand out like a sore thumb. Whereas if I if I miss a little bit of this shoulder right here, we didn't know it was there, and so we're not really going to miss it. Like it's not a big, it's not a huge issue. Same thing here. Like we're going to see that extra stuff, so it's always better to kind of shrink it in a little bit. We can tweak our mask later if we need to. Oops, use the wrong hotkey there. So let's uh, hold Alt and get rid of that stuff. I'm holding Alt to get rid of things and I'm just uh, using the regular paint selection to add things. This is pretty close. Again, I can always tweak it by painting it if I need to. And I'm going to hit Control-0 to zoom out. And let's see how close this stuff gets just by painting over it. That actually gets pretty close. That's surprisingly close there. Let's go ahead and add this stuff to it. Okay, so there it added a bunch of extra stuff. I'm going to hit Control-Z to get rid of that. Add in a little bit. Yeah, so it added all this extra stuff that we don't want. So let's go ahead and hold Alt, Option on a Mac, and paint out some of that stuff. This is going to be a little bit strange looking, but we'll go ahead and get some of that and hold Alt to get rid of that. As you go, it, it seems to get a little bit more precise, or uh, the tolerance for what it wants to select goes down. So it's Right now it's kind of selecting everything, but as we add and subtract and add and subtract, it starts to decrease the tolerance so it's not selecting quite as much or deselecting quite as much each time. All right, so let's go ahead and get rid of some of that stuff, and that's pretty good. Now to see what this is actually masking out, we're going to go ahead and add our mask to the guy. So I'm going to go into uh, back to my layers. We're going to uh, change this into a layer. In the background. I'm just going to click the mask button, and that's not bad. That's pretty close. I think what I'm going to do is divide this so that the shadow and the guy are separate. 
If you want to turn the mask on and off too, you can hold shift and click the mask and just see what it looks like with the mask, without the mask. So there's, there's actually some stuff here around this foot that I want to get. Um, and actually, if you want to see them at the same time, you can go into channels uh, turn on RGB and turn on your layer mask, and then you can see in red what you're actually getting and what you're uh, getting rid of. So let's turn the mask off. We'll go into to channels here and see what we're keeping and what we're getting rid of. So I'm going to click on this layer mask. It's added a new channel for us for the layer mask, and I'm going to zoom in on this slightly here. Since we've got this, this dark area, I'm just going to go into my paintbrush. This would be a lot easier if I could use my uh, stylus. Um, and with a mask, you can essentially just paint um, black for things you want to get rid of and white for stuff you want to keep. So I'm going to switch these colors. I'm going to paint white because I want to keep this little bit of shadow down here. A word too about um, brushes. This has a lot of rough kind of gravel type stuff. So what I'm using is this Kyle's Ultimate Pastel Palooza, which if you're using a newer version of Photoshop is under these dry media brushes. You can right click and scroll down until you get to dry media and then choose one of these. And really you can kind of play around with different types of brushes. One thing that wouldn't work is like a really soft brush. Uh, and we can hit X to switch between black. Oops, let's hit Alt so it gets off of the taskbar. So black to get rid of that stuff. X, oops, and get rid of some of that stuff. And I'm just going to kind of tweak this to get, to get rid of the lightest things. Anything that looks like it's going to stand out, we're going to go ahead and get rid of it because we don't really need to keep all of the shadow. It's not super crucial that we keep every single little bit of the shadow. But what is important is that it doesn't look weird when we go to, to add it. So I want to get rid of some of these like highlights and stuff. Try to make those. Parent, get rid of this stuff here, and this stuff, and this stuff. Now it's so nice because they are just so, so flexible. You can kind of tweak them and edit them endlessly. So let's go ahead and get rid of a bunch of this stuff. I'm actually going to make my brush a little smaller. It would be so nice to be able to use. Um, stylus right here because you get pressure sensitivity and stuff so you don't have to manually change your brush size quite as much you can just press harder or softer and it will do that for you uh, so if you don't have one and you're, you're going to be doing a lot of work like this i strongly recommend that you get uh, some sort of stylus input uh, i'm working on a, a touch screen laptop that has a wacom digitizer built in so that's super handy i can Usually when I don't have a microphone connected, I can just flip it and start painting stuff in and out. But you can also, of course, get like a, a tablet uh, and use that pressure sensitivity there. And I think you can pick those up fairly inexpensively now. Um, you can also, I believe, if you have an iPad and you're working on a, it has to be a MacBook. It doesn't work, I don't think, on Windows computers. But if you have an iPad, um, I want to say it. It has to be an iPad Pro, maybe not. Uh, you might want to check on that. But you can get an app called AstroPad, which lets you see your your screen on the iPad and actually use the Apple Pencil as like a, a stylus, which is kind of handy. The screen is a little bit small, even if you're using the 13-inch the one. Like the aspect ratio doesn't work out quite the same, and so you, you're, like you're missing part of your screen, which is a little bit weird and clunky to work with. But it... Uh, in a pinch, if you're just trying to do some some light retouching and stuff, it definitely helps uh, versus using a mouse like I'm doing. It speeds up this process quite a bit. Uh, all right, so let's get that little bit there, and that's fine. And I don't know why I'm doing this. It's still going to look like a weird piece of grass. I'm just going to make this bigger. And actually, let's, let's make this a little bit random and kind of speed this process up a little bit. I'm going to control Z to undo that. And we're just going to kind of I'm going to make this go a little bit faster. I'm getting sucked into details, which you don't want to do because I have to remember 
this guy's going to be pretty small, and I can actually blur this out and do different things with the mask, so I don't need to get so invested in this. All right, so let's go ahead and get that little bit right there. So control zero. Just, there's a couple of spots here I think that we wanted to fix right there is one. So let's actually change back to that brush that I had before. I'm just going to paint out this stuff. That's fine. Let's make the brush a little bit smaller. I'm going to hit X to paint white and bring this bit back in. I'll get rid of. The way I'm panning around here uh, is I'm holding the space bar. This works on both Mac and PC. If you hold hold down the space bar, it will let you uh, pan and, and zoom. Actually, I think space bar and then control, you can click and drag and it will zoom in and out. Um, a word of warning about that on Mac, the default behavior for Apple is that you press uh, command and space bar will bring up spotlight. So you want to be careful to press spacebar and then hold command on Apple. That's just a that's just a weird, you know, quirky thing that you have to worry about with Apple. Alright, so that's that's pretty close. And then there's a there's like small issues here and there, uh, which are Fine, we're going to worry about that. Notice though that this selection area where we use the pen tool is really, really clean. That's the nice thing about uh, pen selections is that they're just really, really insertly clean. All right, so we've got our guy selected. Let's go ahead and turn off the mask so we can see that. Let's go back to our here and turn on that uh, mask. That actually, let's go ahead and no, oh, we need to apply the mask first. I'm going to hold control. To select that, we're going to delete this, and we're going to just click on a new layer mask. That should add any anything that we've got there. Now, I do want to separate these two. Um, just uh, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit Control. Well, let's fix the mask first, and then we'll hit uh, Control J and duplicate. So you can work on one mask and get everything done, and then you can separate stuff. So um, to edit this mask, we can go to uh, select it. Now this is it's a little bit of a funky way to do this, but you can't just like right click and edit the, the mask the way we want. Uh, or actually you can, you can go to select and mask right here. And it sounds strange, like where are we selecting it and then masking it? Any alpha channel kind of is, like masks and selections kind of are treated as the same thing. So we're just gonna uh, click select and mask. And that's going to open this interface here where we can tweak this a little bit. We can soften it. We can make it a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. So like I said, I always like to trim into it. So we're going to shift the edge down slightly. It's probably going to be hard to see that this is doing anything, but we're going to feather this by a few pixels just to let it, that's going to help it blend in with the background. We don't want to feather it like a crazy amount because it's going to get all soft around the edges. We just want to give it just a touches off and so we're going to put like one to two pixels worth of, of uh, feather there uh, and shift the edge in just slightly. We can smooth it out a little bit but I don't know that that's necessary. It'd be good to smooth this one out maybe. All right so click OK. And next I'm going to hit Control J to duplicate this and on one I am going to take this. Let's go ahead and hide this one. I'm going to uh, do my paintbrush Actually, we're just going to use the, the lasso. So I'm going to go to this little lasso tool right here. Click and drag around that foot and get this entire person right here. And this little bit of the foot right here. And I want to fill this with black. Right now, black, if we look over here on the left, is our background color. If we hit X, it's foreground, but right now it's background. If you want to fill with a background color or a foreground color, there are two keyboard shortcuts. You can either do Control Backspace which will fill with background color. So you see it's filled it with black right there, which will be, or you can do alt backspace, which will fill with the foreground color, which is white, so it's made this part of the mask visible. I want to use the background color, so I'm gonna hit control backspace, and on a Mac this is gonna be control delete, and that will actually uh, get rid of that stuff. Now, I wanna do the opposite on this one. So we're going to hide this guy, Select this one and select this mask. And I'm just going to invert that mask. And if you remember the keyboard shortcut that, for that is Control Shift 
I or Command Shift I on Mac. So Control Shift I will invert the selection, and it doesn't look at first like much has happened, but now you should see marching ants going around the outside here. You can still see the circle in the middle, which means that everything outside of this little uh, shape here in the middle is selected. And what I'm going to do now is again hit Control Backspace, and that will change that. So that way now I've got this guy and his shadow are separate. The guy and the shadow are separate. And that's going to just let us kind of blur the shadow and do different treatments with it and set it to different blend modes, but keep the guy uh, intact. Because so we want him like a normal blend mode, but we might want to do the shadow as like a, uh, you know, maybe a little bit lighter, or we might want to fill it with a color and do different blend modes, but it just gives us more options. So with these two layers, they're already stuck together. I'm going to hit Control G to group them. Say, I'll call this the, uh, I keep hitting my microphone here, guy. And let's go ahead and name this. This is the shadow. And then this is the guy. All right. So let's take our entire group. And I'll put it into our project. And same thing that we did before. We need to kind of place this where it's going to work compositionally, but also where it's going to you know, save us time. Um, but still add to the story. We kind of want this guy walking towards, like he's walking out towards this stuff. Now I've selected these photos carefully to make sure that the lighting kind of matches up. So we've got strong lighting on his left and a strong shadow toward the right. Same thing on this tree. We've got strong lighting on the left and a strong shadow to the right. So I, I took some time, you know, finding the right images and stuff. Uh, you will definitely want to do the same when you're selecting images. And it just, it takes time. It's really just, you know, coming through and looking for the right lighting and the right focal point and all that stuff. Um, or, even better yet, you know, setting up your own images. So now, that, again, we can't make him bigger, but we can change how big he looks by moving him vertically in the scene. Now it looks here like he's uh, off in the distance. One thing that we need to be conscious of, though, is let me come back over here and let's just turn off this um, mask. We need to think about the horizon line, where the horizon line is in relationship to this guy. We're kind of looking down on him, and we in this photo we can actually see where the horizon line is. It's like here somewhere, and it's actually crossing through his head. So we're actually looking up at this stuff, and we're looking down at the rest of his body. The horizon line is your your eye line. And what that means is that you know anything below this, we're going to be looking down at it. We're going to see the top of it. Uh, anything above it, though, we're going to be looking up at it. Since he's really close, it's not like we're going to notice it a lot. But if we put him like up here, obviously that's going to look wrong because we know that our horizon line is like right here, and he, you know, we're looking down at like shoes and legs and stuff. That doesn't fit compositionally or, or in terms of perspective it just doesn't fit so we need to make sure that his head this would actually be right here let's actually move him down just slightly right there that's correct perspective for this person uh we can kind of get away with moving him down like we can move him down quite a bit before it starts to look weird uh but we want to try to keep it fairly close so we're, we're a little bit limited in terms of how high we can move him. We could put him like up here to make him bigger, but it's going to look super, super strange in terms of our, our perspective. So uh, we want to try to keep him around this area. And I don't know, I, I do kind of want to keep him on that third side. I'm thinking we'll bring him, even though it's not technically correct, it's not something that we're going to notice a lot. It does help our composition slightly to have him kind of leading us in down here in the bottom right, and then we see the tree, and then we see this, and then we're going to put our final uh, piece up here in the top left, and that'll give us kind of a nice compositional zigzag. All right, so before we go any further, let's go ahead and save this. Uh, so file, save as, and I already saved this earlier, so you can, when it asks you for a name, go ahead and give it a name, just click save. I'm going to say yes, I want to save over the original file. All right. This, oh, this folder is actually inside the ship folder, so let's move it out. So we've got, we've got these two, and we can collapse them down. For the next part, we're going to be adding like a moon or a planet, 
to this scene and partly compositionally to make it look better but really just so that we can touch on a couple of painting skills um, and for shadowing and lighting and things like that um, planets are always cool to add so this this kind of makes sense for what we're going to do so the first thing that we need is a new layer so i'm going to hold control shift and then hit the n key for new so control n will make a new file but control shift n will make a new layer we're going to call this uh, moon. All right, so we've got our moon layer, just a blank layer, and I'm going to go up here to my circular selection, my elliptical selection. You drag it out, it's going to be any kind of weird shape. We want to make sure there's a perfect circle, so I'm going to hold shift, and then we'll make sure it stays a perfect circle. We hold spacebar, and we can move it around, so we can put it in different places. Release spacebar, change the size, hold spacebar. Yeah, pretty easy. I'm going to put it somewhere like there. That's fine. We can always move it around later. Um, you do kind of want to make it maybe larger than what you, you actually want to use. Uh, so you can always again scale it down. You can't scale it up though. So I've got that. I'm going to fill it with a gray. So we're going to go up here to our gray color. And I'm just going to hit um, for foreground. I'm going to hit Alt backspace and it's going to fill with a middle gray. We're going to uh, be using blend modes and all sorts of like shading and stuff on this, but I first want to make sure that this looks like a sphere. And this is where our painting techniques come in. So when you're painting something and you want to add shadow and highlight to it and you want it to um, transition gradually and realistically, this is a good technique to use and there are a lot of artists who actually uh, use this but to, to in much more complex ways. Well, you'll start with a shape and maybe fill in your basic shape. In this case, it's just a circle. And you'll add another layer on top of it, and we'll call this one shadow. And then you'll add another layer. We'll call this one highlight. So a shadow layer and a highlight layer. And with each of these, and you can do both of them. You can right click, and we want to create clipping mask. This is different from the layer masks that we've been using up to this point. So the clipping mask, what it does is it only shows up on the layer below. And so we've got this one clipping to the moon, and then uh, this one then is clipping to shadow, which is also clipping to moon. So if I go on the highlight layer, for instance, I'm just going to grab some color up here, and hit my paintbrush tool, let's uh, make this a little bit bigger start painting anywhere that I paint it's only going to show up on that layer if we right click it and release the clipping mask we can see uh, oops so I've actually kind of selected still um, you know I can paint outside the lines here but then if I right click and create clipping mask and it, again it's only going to show up on top of that layer so that just makes it real easy and real fast to um, paint over a, a specific shape. So you kind of make the shape and then you can add your shadows and highlights without having to be too careful about going back over the same lines again. I'm going to delete everything in that, so I'm going to hit Control A and get marching ants around the entire thing, and then I'm just going to hit Delete, and that will clear out that uh, layer. So let's start with a shadow. I'm going to use a brush for this, so we're going to go up to our general brushes and just use the soft round brush. Make it really big. Actually, I'm going to use my Alt right click and drag thing so I can make it about the same size as the moon. Let's make it a little bit bigger than that. And I'm actually going to go ahead and just use the same color that I used before, the same middle gray. So I'm going to hold Alt and click on that, and that's actually going to sample that color. So now we have that same middle gray. But before I start painting, I'm going to go into the shadow and I want to change this blend mode. So blend modes are in this. Uh, little option on our layers panel. Right now it says normal, which means it's just everything else uh, below it is hidden. It's, it's completely opaque. But with different blend modes, we can do different things with it. So we'll, these options will darken things below. These will lighten things below. These are kind of mix. Um, then these are like invert. They all do different things. You can kind of play around with them. Uh, for now, I'm just going to set this one to multiply. So even though I'm painting the same color, it's going to start to get really, really dark. And we'll see that it, now it's it's made this nice dark circle. It's just you know, a little bit slow here. But I'm going to paint this. And then just try to get that same 
kind of gradual, it was nice kind of gradient that you would get from a, uh, a planet. It's good to look at reference. If you have reference, go ahead and, and pull that out. And you want to match the lighting from the sun here. We have the sun uh, on the left and the, our shadow is going to the right. So we want to make sure that the shadow here on our planet matches our light source. In this case, the sun, which would be illuminating both, uh, both things equally. Now, this is set to multiply already. We're going to be changing the moon, so we can change the moon. Uh, later, we're going to set the moon to, like, screen or something. And right now, it's not quite dark enough, so let's go ahead and leave the moon on the screen blend mode. I'm going to go back to my shadow. We can actually change the blend mode of the brush as well. Right now, the blend mode of the brush is normal, but we can change that to multiply as well. And what that'll do is that every time we paint, it's going to get a little bit darker, so we can add this nice uh, gradation like that. So we'll end up with a nice kind of crescent moon there where the moon disappears with uh, the light of the sky, or with the color of the sky. All right, so there's our, our shadow. We can go ahead and do kind of the opposite thing with our highlights. Let's go ahead and set the moon back to, uh, oops, to normal so we can see what it's doing. On highlight, we're gonna set that to screen. So with screen, um, things basically just do the opposite, they get brighter. I'm gonna make my brush just a little bit smaller here. Oh, since I have this currently selected, that's gonna make a problem. So let's go ahead and hit our bracket key to make this a little bit smaller. Still painting. Um, with the blend mode. Now this brush is still set to multiply. So let's and see what it's giving us. I'm going to set this to screen, and this gives us a nice bright moon. So it's looking pretty good. Um, of course, we can always go in and tweak it, make it better, but uh, what I want to do now is go ahead and add a mask to this. So I have another file that we're going to be using. This is our texture right here. So we can open this with uh, uh, Photoshop. And actually, there's not a lot of preparation. I thought we might do something to this, but I think we can go ahead and do any preparation inside of our main file. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop this here, and it's actually fairly small. Um, and I do want it to clip, but I don't want it to clip just yet. I want it to kind of, let's move it down underneath for positioning purposes. I'm gonna go ahead and set moon back to normal so I can kind of see where this is in relationship to the moon. Let's go ahead and put it on top of the moon and set it to screen. And actually, I'm just going to set the moon to screen as well. Uh, so I'm just kind of looking at the angles of these lines. Not, I think that's fine. Just for now, that's it is what it is, so it's fine. So I want to select a portion of this, and I want it to look round as if it's going around the this spherical moon. So I'm going to hold Control and click our moon layer's thumbnail here so we get that little uh, selection again. So we get that little circle. And then with this layer active, let's just go back to normal. I'm going to go to Filter, and we're going to go to Distort, and we're going to go to Spherize. And just make sure it's at 100%. Click OK. It does it once. Let's actually do it again. I'm going to go to Filter. And if you've done a filter once, you can just uh, you'll see it right here at the top. It's just going to do it a second time. So if you spherize it 100% twice, it'll make it like this perfect uh, spherical wrap. And so I could either use the selection that I've got to make a mask, or I could just right click and create clipping mask. And now it's going to show up only on on that layer. Now I can also bring this down further in the stack like that. I can put it maybe over top of the shadow or um, actually we do want it under the shadow. Then I can just kind of play around with its blend mode. So right now it's uh, still in normal so we'll set it to maybe multiply or screen. We can kind of see just test different things out and see what what looks good. I'm thinking for something a little bit stronger than that. And Linear burn actually is looking pretty good, so I think we can can go ahead and do that. And there we go. So Control D. There's our 
moon off in the distance. Um, now there's more obviously we can do with the, the blur, and we do want to kind of get this ship to fit a little bit better with the color scheme. So we want to kind of tie these things together. Now this guy is he's pretty close, he's got real strong light on him. The ship did not though, so the ship has a little bit uh, more that needs to be done. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just group all this stuff together. So I hit Control G to group, and call this the moon. And let's jump back into the ship and we'll add some adjustment layers to this to, to fix it up. So I'm going to add an adjustment layer. And this will be the last thing that we look at. Adjustment layers let you change the con uh, color and and really everything of everything below that adjustment layer. So if I create an adjustment layer, uh, and we're going to be using the um, uh, curves here, and then change one of these, let's just do like cross process. It's going to change everything underneath. So notice it hasn't affected our hiker guy and it hasn't affected the moon because those are a above it, but it has affected the ship and, and the background and everything below it. If I drag this up on top of it, now we can see it's affecting the moon and the hiker guy. But in this case, I want it to affect the ship and only the ship. And in this case, we can use clipping mask to do that same thing. Now for clipping mask, we could right click and create clipping mask that way, or we can also use this little uh, clipping mask right here, which is what this button is here that's now highlighted. So now it's only affecting the ship. I don't want to do cross process, we're just going to go back to default. What I do want to do though is let's zoom in on this a little bit. I want to increase the contrast here in the sails up at the top. So to do that, let's drag our layers down a little bit. Uh, this is pretty easy. The nice thing about curves is that we have this little button right here, which is a little hand with two arrows. And if I uh, normally use curves, I might like click and create a point in here, but this little hand actually lets us sample. You'll notice the little point is jumping around over here in our curves interface. Uh, and just click and drag here. So I want to make this darker. So I'm going to click and drag on that, and it's going to become darker. Now the whole ship is becoming darker, and that's a problem, but we can fix that. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. But let's just do something like that. For now, that looks fine. Now let's fix this issue with the ship, the entire ship being dark. I didn't really want to mess with this part. I just wanted to fix those sails. So for that, we can use a gradient, or we can kind of paint out this mask with a real soft brush here. So we can use our gradient tool. The default gradient just uses the foreground and background color. Uh, in this case, we've got black and white here. Uh, and if you just click and drag, uh, oops, currently, make sure first that your mask is selected. Click and drag. Anything that's white will become opaque, and anything that's black will become uh, transparent. So we've kind of done the opposite of what we wanted to do. Black, white is the start of the gradient, and black is the end of the gradient. So now I've made it so it only affects the ship and not the sails. I want to do it the opposite way, so I'm going to go to the sails up here and then drag down to the bottom of the ship, and it'll kind of gradually fade from one to the other. And we can kind of play around with this real quickly uh, and try different things out with it. So we'll do that. So it kind of fades a little bit more gradually. So here's without the mask, everything's dark. Here's with the mask, just the tops of the sails are dark. And here's without any adjustment at all. So a quick way to fix things. There. Now we can also adjust our colors. So I'm going to make another adjustment layer here. That. Let's go ahead and go to. Um, let's do hue and saturation. Same thing. I'm going to click this little button so that it clips to just the ship. And we're going to increase. Um, we'll increase the lightness or decrease the light lightness just a little bit. We'll increase the saturation just a bit because it was kind of faded out before. Add another adjustment layer. We'll do, um, oh, I don't know. I guess we'll do exposure. Make the entire thing a little bit brighter. So we'll adjust exposure and kind of push the gamma down a little bit. Exposure up a little bit. Usually with these, you want to just kind of tweak it just slightly. Like you don't want to do too much with it, just to kind of sharpen that up a little bit. Now we can always 
go and kind of tweak and add more stuff to it. Um, but I wanted to touch on the basics, and really those those are the core things: masking, adjustment layers, um, painting, uh, sourcing your photos and stuff, making sure that you have things that that fit. And from there, you can really kind of do anything, and really it's just a matter of time and how much attention you put into to details. The rest of the tools will become helpful, but that's really kind of the main things that you'll need to know and, and the core concepts. So I hope you found that helpful. Uh, leave a like and uh, let me know if there's if you have questions and comments, and I'll see you in the next video.